now that we've talked about the movements of people and kind of the economy of the late 1800s, early 1900s, now we're going to talk about the political movement of this point in time and how the social and economic changes influence the political changes. And this is known as the progressive movement. So, main idea. Industrial development raised the standard of living for millions of Americans, but it also brought about the rise of national labor unions and clashes between industry and labor. Um, so social problems in rural and urban settings gave rise to the progressive movement. So social problems led to progressive movement. Working conditions for labor. So you had dangerous working conditions. In steel mills, the Bessemer converters belched fire and sparks, as you saw in the image from last PowerPoint, which was the um, Bessemer steel process and the, the big vat spewing um, fire and sparks. The floors then around them were so hot that water sizzled on them. Um, textile workers inhaled the dust and fibers that filled the air in the mills. So think textiles, those are fabrics and stuff. Um, coal miners labored deep in underground and they faced the perils of explosives and cave-ins. Um, so like when you're underground, you don't have really a whole lot of protection from those things happening. So these are a lot of really dangerous working conditions. Um, in Carnegie, um, this is Carnegie Steelworks, um, in Illinois, you can see the change of shift, um, and how much smoke there was around. Another demonstration of, um, the dangerous working conditions from Upton Sinclair, he was a journalist and he wrote a book called The Jungle, like just completely blasting the working conditions. And he said there would be meat stored in great piles in rooms and thousands of rats would race about on it. A man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of the dried dung of rats. These rats were nuisances and the packers would put out poisoned bread for them. They would die and then rats, bread, and meat would go into the hoppers together. So people would be eating all of that. Um, sadly enough, my seventh grade history teacher, she decided to have us read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. And I'll save you from that. But she had us read it on hot dog day at lunch. I can promise you that none of us ate hot dogs at lunch. Um, so unfortunate, but yeah, it's, it's a nasty book. If you ever want to read about how awful the working conditions were, I highly suggest Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Um, you've also got alliances and unions that started up during this time period. This is an image of the Housewives Alliance, and they demanded proper inspection of meat. Eat no meat, buy no meat, eat fresh vegetables, because at least you know where the fresh vegetables are coming from, at least back then you did. So working conditions also included child labor. It was common for 10-year-old boys to be in the mines in Pennsylvania. Um, and at the turn of the century, almost 2 million American children between the ages of 10 and 15 were employed. Think about it. You'd already be employed full-time. You wouldn't be in school anymore. Um, child labor was especially common in coal mines. The industrialists recruited children, usually small boys aged 10 to 12, to bend over the mine chutes and pick out slate pieces from the coal. Occasionally, a boy became mangled in the machinery or fell down a chute and turned out smothered to death. Um, it's really unfortunate, but it is a fact of life for the turn of the century, 1900. Um, this is an image of a girl working in a milk factory. Um, you can see it's all getting bottled and she, she looks fairly young. I'd put her between eight and 10. This is an image of a boy. I'm not sure what kind of factory this is, but again, looks to be between eight and 12 years old. Um, so not very old. So think about it. If you've got younger brothers or sisters or think middle school, like fifth through seventh grade, this is what you'd be doing. You'd be working. You wouldn't be in school. Um, again, you can see all of these boys, they, they're working with lumber, um, and all of them look under the age of 15. So again, think about it. You're in middle school and you're working, cutting down trees, the saws, all that stuff. So it, it's amazing to think of today. So more working conditions. You have very long hours, very low wages, 
no job security, there was always somebody to replace you, and no benefits, aka no health care, no paid vacation, stuff like that. In 1900, steel workers worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and textile workers often worked 60 to 84 hours a week. So that's a lot of work. Um, with the constant threat of being fired, some industrial workers near the end of the 19th century were willing to take home pay as low as $5 a week. So $5 a week for 12 hours a day, seven days a week, or eight cents an hour. Um, immigrants often took the lowest amount of pay because, well, they were fighting for these jobs with the people who had been here. In 1907, steel workers earned about 16 cents an hour. So again, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, 16 cents an hour. That makes you really rethink how much people are making today, doesn't it? Um, a lot of these companies had company towns. So many people who worked in factories outside of cities lived in employer-owned villages. The factory owners benefited both from an immediately available workforce and from the rent it collected from the workers. Um, the workers had to suffer the effects of pollution as well as isolation from community schools and shopping districts. Um, employers often paid company town workers in scrip, which is a form of currency that could only be used to buy goods in the employer-owned stores with inflated prices. So you were forced to live in their town, work in their factory for a really, really low pay, pay rent to the company, and then you also were paid in scrip, which you could only buy goods from the employee, employer owned stores. So everything you do is surrounding your employer. So this is an example of a company town as well. Employment of women. So by 1890, one million women were working in textile mills, garment factories, and other industries. Um, women usually received less than half the wages of men in comparable jobs. Thousands of women jammed elbow to elbow in sweatshop assembly lines, suffered permanent back injuries from crouching over tiny workspaces all day or night. Um, garment factories were stiflingly hot, and in the summer with the windows open, women worked amidst swarms of flies. Um, women worked so rapidly in the garment factories that they often plunged their showing machine needle right through their fingers or bone, but had to keep on working. Um, it was not exactly comfortable to be a woman working at this time, much less a man, but if you're making less than half of what men did, it, it's even more of a real slap in the face. So what was the progressive movement? The progressive movement used government to reform the problems created by industrialization. So Teddy Roosevelt had the square deal, which the four parts of the square deal, so the four points of the square, First was regulation of unfair business practices, so those monopolies and all that stuff. Um, second was consumer protection, so protect the buyer. Third was increased rights for workers, um, so hopefully getting rid of those long hours and dangerous conditions. And then protection of natural resources. The reason that we have most of the national parks that we do today is because of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, Woodrow Wilson then, following Teddy Roosevelt, had his new freedom, which supported legislation to control monopolies known as the Antitrust Acts, specifically the Clayton Antitrust Act and the Sherman Antitrust Act. So the goals of the progressive movement. First, government controlled by the people. So in order to make the government more responsive to the will of the people, it had to be controlled by the people. So it said, hey, look, we've got political corruption and a lot of waste in the city and state governments, so let's get rid of it. Reformers said we need to expand democracy by allowing voters to have a greater direct impact on public policy. Um, so it guaranteed economic opportunities through government regulation. It also eliminated social injustices. Um, so a lot of the racial injustices that were going on the goal was to get rid of them. Now, the progressive movement wasn't perfect. It didn't get rid of everything, but it did at least try to. So accomplishments that the progressive movement had. In local governments, you had new forms in order to meet the needs of increasing urbanization. So instead of just having like a state government, you would have like a commission and a council manager. So in Prince William County, we've got a board of supervisors. That helps to meet the needs of what's going on in Prince William County, but they don't have the same amount of power that state and federal government has.
in state governments, you have the referendum, which allows citizens to approve or reject a law passed by legislature. Initiative is when citizens can put a proposed new law directly on the ballot in the next election by getting voters' signatures on a petition. So say that I want free school lunch for everybody, um, and I want it to go on the 2015 ballot. Well, I can get that put directly on the ballot instead of having to go through a local approval process if I get enough voter signatures on a petition. Um, recall is a procedure that permits voters to remove public officials from office before the next election. So it's kind of like um, impeachment, but it's for local and state government. Um, in elections, you have primary elections now. So it's when an elect when citizens can vote to select nominees for the upcoming elections. So instead of having 20 nominees for the Republican Party on the ballot in November, you'll have a primary election in like May, June, which will narrow down the field of candidates to one or two Republican candidates. Um, then you also have the direct election of U.S. Senators. That's the 17th Amendment. Um, so prior to that, the state legislatures could elect them. Um, so interest groups bought the Senate seats, um, or political machines controlled the process. So it wasn't a democratic process. Now it became a democratic process where the individual voter, me and you, can vote for the U.S. senators. And then also you have the secret ballot where your vote isn't made public. You don't have to tell anybody who you're voting for or what you're voting for, um, it, they used to make you say, and that goes completely against the Constitution. So the progressives got the secret ballot and made it official. Um, in child labor, the progressives made it so that muckraking literature, so that's when people wrote bad things about what was going on in the economic conditions and the work conditions, like they were writing it the way it was. So Jacob Rees, um, Upton Sinclair. So that that piece from The Jungle that I read to you a little while ago, that is muckraking literature. Um, you also have child labor laws that say, okay, you can't work if you're under the age of this. And you can't work more than this many hours um, if you're over this age. And by the way, you have to start going to school and stuff like that. So that's why now, if you want to work before the age of 16, you have to get school permission um, to prove that you are like able to handle a job and everything. Um, that's why, because of these child labor laws back then. Impact of the labor unions. So unions were among the first groups to go and take action against a lot of the negative aspects of American industrialization. A huge labor group that you had was the Knights of Labor. They were very idealistic. Um, so they were under the leadership of Terrence Powderly, and it opened the union to women, blacks, immigrants, unskilled laborers. I mean, think about that. At this point in time, that's thrown a lot of different groups together that weren't necessarily thrown together before this point. The Knights gained more than 700,000 members by 1896. That's incredible. What they wanted was an eight-hour workday, safer working conditions, compensation for job-related injury, so that's workman's comp, um, and equal pay for men and women. So they had the, these great ambitions that they really wanted to fulfill. The American Federation of Labor, or the AFL, they were a lot more practical than the Knights of Labor. Um, they were under the leadership of Samuel Gompers. Um, they invited only white, male, skilled laborers to join them. Their goals were more realistic than the Knights. Um, they wanted an eight-hour workday, so that's a similar one. And then they also said that they had the right of the union to represent workers in collective bargaining with the employers. So instead of, I'm going to set up my own agreement with the employers and Susie is going to set up her own agreement with the employers and John is going to set up his own agreement with the employers, we would now all go to the union in order to represent all of us in order to get the best things for everybody. You've also got the American Railway Union, which was led by Eugene V. Debs. He got a lot of progressive reforms fixed for the railways. Um, the Industrial Ladies Garment Workers Union, they had a strike and it succeeded. They won. Um, 
So they, they got better conditions in their garment factories. Strikes. So when, when people didn't agree with what was being done to them and how they were being treated by the leaders of these industries, they went on strike, which meant that they didn't work. So the reaction against the unions by the industrialists was usually very violent at this point in time. Um, so you can see a strike for better conditions in an eight-hour workday. These garment workers are striking. They're going to refuse to make any garments until they get what they want. Haymarket Square. So 8,000 workers went on strike in order to demand an eight-hour workday. Several workers were killed by police, and at a rally to protest the killings, a bomb was thrown at policemen. Um, in the ensuing riot, then, seven police officers and four civilians were killed. So employers used the events to turn public opinion against the labor movement. And very soon after this happened, the Knights of Labor disbanded um, because they were seen as a little bit too idealistic and causing a lot of these problems. So the Haymarket Square riots were very, very violent and lots of people died. The Homestead Strike. So the AFL, American Federation of Labor, workers struck in reaction to a surprise wage cut. So all of a sudden, their wages were cut and they were like, wait a minute, we don't like this. We're going to stop working. Um, Homestead is up in Pennsylvania, by the way, right outside Pittsburgh. Um, so the manager closed the plant and hired 300 guards in order to protect it against the workers during the strike. When the guards arrived, they were then attacked by the workers. And 16 guards and workers ended up dead. And the National Guard had to be sent out in order to end the riot. So it's like an army was sent to end the riot and stop the fighting. So it was a really big deal back then. Another huge deal strike was the Pullman strike. So in 1894, workers for the Pullman Railway Car Company went on strike, protecting continued high prices and rent in the company town after the wages had been cut. So their wages were cut, but then they still had to pay high prices and rent in that company town. Remember back how the company town basically owned you? This is a prime example of it. So the strike spread throughout the West which paralyzed the railroad industry. It basically stopped it. President Grover Cleveland had to send in troops to clear out the workers, move the trains, and end the strike. It became a huge deal. So labor union gains, you have limited work hours. So most industries set a maximum number of work hours, generally an eight to 10 hour day. You have regulated working conditions. So most industries provided workers compensation if you were injured on the job. By 1912, child labor laws in 38 states, so three quarters of the states, had set minimum age restrictions and health standards, so that's a really big deal. Antitrust laws at the same time. Sherman Antitrust Act said any business structure that restrains trade or monopolies was illegal. So you could not have a monopoly anymore because it restrained trade. So the smaller mom and pop businesses couldn't trade because of those monopolies, so this is to protect the smaller businesses. And then the Clayton Antitrust Act expanded the Sherman Antitrust Act a little bit more, and it outlawed price fixing, so these bigger monopolies would say, okay, this is what the price is going to be, and I can afford that price to be that low, but the smaller companies can't afford for that. Um, and it also exempted unions from the Sherman Act, so unions could no longer be considered monopolies, which was helpful for the unions. Um, so these were known as the bosses of the Senate. Um, like these were the big, the big trust, trust busters. Um, one sees his finish unless good government retakes the ship. So the government had to retake the ship to get rid of these trusts. Um, you can see these protests. More protesters. Women's suffrage. So this was a forerunner of the modern protest movement. Um, they were benefited from strong leadership. Susan B. Anthony, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, they encouraged women to enter the labor force during World War I. And they also resulted in the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which gave women the right to vote. So very positive changes thanks to the women's suffrage um, modern protest movement. 